This morning, my, my message is titled, Made for More. Made for More. And I think that oftentimes we, we get so focused on who we are and we get focused on the mundane, the day-to-day life, the things that we, we see as our own physical uh, hindrances, things that hold us back. We know our thoughts, we know our inner thoughts, we know, we know ourselves, and sometimes we can not think of the fact that we have truly been made for more, that we've been made in the image and the likeness of God, that He's given us so many blessings to be able to share to the world, to be able to show Him to the world, and yet we, we don't always walk in that. In fact, we usually don't walk in that. And so what I want to do this morning is is point out some things in the Word about God stepping out before us, God going before us. The Word says that He goes before us. He prepares the way for us, that the Holy Spirit will go before us and will give um, give us favor in the world. Guys, God has given us authority to operate in him and in his name so that he can be made known he doesn't do it so you and i can be made known he does it so he can be made known so that the world will see that there's a difference between the world and the way the world does things and god and the way he does things but how are they going to see the difference if we don't step out in the more we're made for more You're made for more. Every single one of you are truly made for more than what you're doing right now. I'm made for more than what I'm doing right now. I'm not just speaking to you. I'm speaking to myself. We've got to come in to the realization that we're not going to be here very long and that the people that are around us, that we get to impact, that we get to influence, they're not going to be here long. They've got to see God in us through us, not in a prideful way, not stepping out to do all this wild, cool stuff because, hey, we're cool, but because he's cool. They're not going to know if we don't show them. There is so much influence in the world today that takes our minds off, our eyes off of our focus on the Father and on Jesus, on the Holy Spirit. There's so much that if we don't purposefully look for him, we're not going to find him. God shows up in many different ways. Sometimes it can be dramatic. It can be, but generally it's in that still, small voice. He wants our hearts. He wants our love, our devotion. He wants us to be dedicated to him, walking purposefully, in this relationship with Him. That's so hard to do if we're so fixated on everything else going on around us. The world is so noisy these days. It's so noisy. We've got to be still. We've got to listen so that we can truly do what He's calling us to do. So that when He has somebody that He wants us to love on, we're going to hear Him say, Go love on that person and do it like this because this is what's going to minister to them. This is what's going to touch their hearts today. It might sound absurd. It might sound ridiculous. He might tell you, say this to this person. And you're like, what? Are you kidding me? They're going to think I'm crazy. Lots of people think I'm crazy. Most of the time, I think I'm crazy. So I don't blame them, you know? But when God says, Nathan, say this to this person, I try to always be faithful to do that because he's already gone before us. He's already laid the groundwork, the foundation, and all they're waiting for is to hear that one word because sometimes people say, I need God to speak directly to me. I want to hear him speak directly to me. So if it sounds crazy, guess what? It might be, and it might be just that, because they said, I want to hear him say this. I want to see him do 
this. And by you stepping out and doing that, is God answering the, the request of their heart. I've seen it happen over and over and over. Has anyone else seen it happen? Heard of it happen? Watch it. Has it happened to you? It's happened to me. And it's mind-blowing. It's like, oh, yes. It's just that, that sweet kiss from our Father saying, I see you. I know you. I love you. I want you. I want to be in relationship with you guys. He will use us to do that. He will, and he wants to. All we have to do is be obedient about it. So, made for more. I, I kind of co-titled this, The Time Is Now, because the time has to be now. It has to be now. If you've had a word from the Lord before, if you've been um, kind of nudged or um, influenced to do something or say something, but you didn't, and then Satan came in and said, I can't, see, see, God's not going to use you. You don't even do what he tells you to do. You know, I've had that. It stinks. It's not fun. But God's not done. <laughs> that didn't close you off from being able to do what he has for you to do. It doesn't. It doesn't at all. You know why? Because our God is so much bigger than us. He truly is. He wants to use you. He wants to use me to be his hands and feet in this world. He truly does. And if you haven't, that's okay. There's still more time. If you still have breath drawing into your lungs, there's still plenty more time. If you're watching this and you're bedridden, and you can't get out of bed and you feel like, well, what good am I to the Lord? If you are still drawing breath in your lungs, you can still be used by him. You still have an area to be able to influence, to be able to impact for him. I have some stories that I want to read to you out of the Bible. And most of the time I don't like reading a bunch, but this is the Word of God. I'm going to try to make it not boring the way that I read it. Um, but if I do, I'm sorry. You can always go back and reread them yourself, okay? But these that I'm, going to, that I'm going to be talking about, as I'm reading these, as I'm getting into what God has done, how God has used individual people, I want you to think about if you were there, okay? So if you can, picture in your mind's eye you actually being there and watching God move in these ways, Okay? And then I also want you to realize that the same God that's doing this is the same God that's living today. He is living, He's active in your lives. The Word says sharper than any two-edged sword. He's very, very real today, and the same God that did this is the same God that you have absolute, unhindered access to. First, we're going to start off in Exodus 14 verses 15 through 30. Exodus 14, verses 15 through 30. You will quickly uh, recognize this, I'm sure. Then the Lord said to Moses, I love what he says here. He says, why are you crying out to me? Please keep in mind that this, this story happened after all of the miracles all the signs that God did through Moses and Aaron in Egypt, this happened right after this. God says to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Essentially, don't you understand the power that I've given you already? Have you not, do you not realize it? He says, tell the Israelites to move on. Raise your staff and stretch out your hands over the sea to divide the water so that the Israelites can go through the sea on dry ground. I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they will go in after them. And I will gain glory through Pharaoh and all his army, through his chariots and his horsemen. The Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I gain glory through Pharaoh, his chariots and his horsemen. 
Then the angel of God. Dang it, I just locked it out. These things are good, but sometimes they can be a pain. Then the angel of God, who had been traveling in front of Israel's army, withdrew and went behind them. The pillar of cloud also moved from in front and stood behind them, coming between the armies of Egypt and Israel. Throughout the night, the cloud broke, uh, brought darkness to one side and light to the other side. So neither went near the other all night long. You have to understand, the Israelites could see the Egyptian army closing in on them, and it was creating fear. So God said, boom, I'm going to stand between you. I'm going to make it dark on their side, light on your side, so you guys won't even be able to see each other. That's our God. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and all that night... The Lord drove the sea back with a strong east wind and turned it into dry land. The waters were divided, and the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground, with a wall of water on their right and on their left. It wasn't like it just piled up. It was literally two walls of water. The Egyptians pursued them, and all Pharaoh's horses and chariots and horsemen followed them into the sea. During the last watch of the night, the Lord looked down from the pillar of fire and cloud at the Egyptian army and threw it into confusion. He jammed the wheels of their chariots so that they had difficulty driving. And the Egyptians said, let's get away from the Israelites. Novel idea. The Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea so that the waters may flow back over the Egyptians and their chariots and horsemen. Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and at daybreak the sea went back to its place. The Egyptians were fleeing toward it, and the, and the Lord swept them into the sea. The water flowed back and covered the chariots and horsemen, the entire army of Pharaoh that had followed the Israelites into the sea. Not one of them survived. But the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground with a wall of water on their right and on their left. That day the Lord saved Israel from the hand of the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians lying dead on the shore. And when the Israelites saw the mighty hand of the Lord displayed against the Egyptians, the people feared the Lord and put their trust in him and in Moses, his servant. People, people think, well, that's just some crazy kind of story. That couldn't be real. That's 100% real. It's 100% real. The great news is, is we have technology today that allows us to go and you can literally see chariot wheels in the middle of the Red Sea where this happened. People are like, well, nobody knows where this actually happened. Well, yes, they actually do know where it happened. They've actually, there was a pillar set up on one side of the Red Sea here and one set up on the other side over there. Right now, one of those pillars has been cut down, but the one that still stands has graffiti all over it, but there's actual writing on it. You can literally see it today. It's amazing. It's incredible. But these things truly did absolutely happen. That's a God that we serve. We don't think that if we're stuck in this hard place, that God can move on our behalf. But God wants to move on your behalf, just like he wanted to move on their behalf. Why? So that the Israelites and the Egyptians would know that he is God. God didn't give Moses the ability to be able to stretch out his hand and those waters depart so Moses would be some great famous person. He did so that God would get the glory. And that's exactly what he wants to do with us. What I want to encourage you guys with is if you're stuck in a hard place and you are trying to cry out to God, are you, are you thinking, I want God to get the glory in this? Or are you just thinking, I really want to get saved from this tough spot? Now, don't, don't feel like I'm coming down on you because the Israelites here, they just really wanted to get out of this tight spot. And God loved them. You know that God knew that even after he split this sea and they went through, that just a short time later, that he would be talking with Moses on Mount Sinai, giving him the Ten Commandments, 
and that those same people that he saved were going to fashion a golden calf to worship instead of God? He knew that. He already knew that, and he still saved them. That means he knows that when he saves you from something, he knows that you're not going to be perfect after that. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And he wants to save you. He wants to do it. Because when he does it, he's going to get the glory. Remember to give him the glory. Doesn't it seem really impossible for, for water to part? For people to be able to walk through on dry ground? I love that he says that it was parted and it dried for them to be able to walk through. Like parting it's not enough. Nobody wants to get their feet all muddy. That's going to make that journey a little difficult. Um, but Trinity and Tyler took Tenley on a walk yesterday. And they used the stroller, but they went out on some of our trails. And they were a little muddy out there. So they got a little mud in the wheels. Made it a little difficult, didn't it, Tyler? Oh, yeah. Yeah. God didn't want it to be difficult. He wanted them to be able to get through. And then he still, once they got through, he cogged the wheels of these Egyptians. He will save you, and those that are coming against you, he will make it difficult for them. Did you know that, that God parted water three more times in the word after that? Like Moses's was, that was, that was the big one, you know, it was the first one. Everybody's like, wow, that's crazy. That's pretty wild. He did it three more times. I don't know if it's because people are like, yeah, we've seen that before. You know? <laughs> Probably not. I think every time that the waters got parted would be pretty stinking awesome. The next time was Joshua, which was, um, uh, he was Moses' helper. You know, Aaron was alongside with Moses. But Joshua was, was really being brought up by Moses being brought up, and God used Joshua afterwards to lead the children of Israel. Well, he does the same thing essentially with Joshua whenever they're getting ready to go in and take the, take the promised land. It says, Joshua told the people, sorry, this is in Joshua 3, 5 through 17. Joshua told the people, consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. Why do you think he would say, consecrate yourselves? When God wants you to move, He wants you to be ready for it. He wants you to be ready for it. He wants people to see that you are set apart, that you are different, that you are working out your salvation with fear and trembling, and that God will move when you do. It's very important. Joshua said to the priests, Take up the Ark of the Covenant and pass, pass on ahead of the people. So they were back there. He says, Pass on ahead of them so that. So they took up the ark, and they went ahead of them. And the Lord said to Joshua, Today I will bring, uh, I will begin to exalt you in the eyes of all Israel. So Israel, they, were, they thought very, very highly of Moses because of all the crazy, awesome, amazing things God did through Moses. Now the successor's taking, taking over, and God wants to prove, I'm with you just like I was with him. The Lord said to Joshua, Today I will begin to exalt you in the eyes of all Israel, so they may know that I am with you as I was with Moses. Tell the priest to carry the Ark of the Covenant. When you reach the edge of the Jordan's water, go and stand in the river. Joshua said to the Israelites, Come here, listen to the words that the Lord has said. He tells them all this stuff. He says that uh, he will certainly drive out before us the Canaanites, Hittites, uh, Hivites, the Perizzites, the Girgashites, Amorites, and the Jebusites. See the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of all the earth will go into the Jordan ahead of you. Now then, choose twelve men from the tribes of Israel, one from each tribe. And as soon as the priests who carry the Ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, set foot in the Jordan, its waters flowing downstream will be cut off and stand up in a heap. So the, he does it a little bit differently this time. He cuts the water off, and it starts to just pile up in a heap. That would still be pretty stinking awesome. I mean, it really would be. So when the people broke camp to cross the Jordan, the priest carrying the Ark of the Covenant went ahead of them. Now the Jordan is at flood stage all during harvest. 
Yet as soon as the priests who carried the ark reached the Jordan and their feet touched the water's edge, the water from upstream stopped flowing. It piled up in a heap a great distance away at a town called Adam or Adam in the vicinity of Zeranath. While the water flowing down uh, to the Sea of the Arabah, that is the Dead Sea, was completely cut off. So the people crossed over uh, opposite Jericho. The priest who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stopped in the middle of the Jordan and stood on dry ground. While all Israel passed by until the whole nation had completed crossing on dry ground. Isn't that amazing? He did it again. Well, then he does it again in Second Kings 2, 5-9. He does it with um, uh, Elisha, and he does it with Elijah. So Elijah did it the first time, and then um, and then he goes back and he does it again with Elisha. I'm not going to read those, but those are stinking awesome. I'll kind of paraphrase real quick so that you can get the picture of what's happening. It's the third and fourth time that God literally splits water and allows them through, but but these two times they're a little bit different. These two times they weren't being chased by anybody that was going to kill them. They weren't going into battle in lands that God was going to give them. Literally, it was basically for their convenience. God wanted them to go there, and there wasn't another way to get there. God said, go there, and they're like, that's great. Let's go. And then they're like, how are we going to get there? We don't have a boat. There's not a bridge. You said go there. You led me here. How are we supposed to get there? Have you ever been in your life where you know that you're going where God told you to go, but there's, not, there's something impossible to be able to overcome? You're like, God, you told me to go there. And unless I just heard you completely wrong, I'm positive this is what you said. But it's not possible. I can't do what you asked me to do. I can't. I can't swim. I'm going to drown. God's like, don't sweat it. He says, listen, just do this. It wasn't their plan. He said, take off your cloak, slap the water with it, and it'll part. Does that make any sense to anyone whatsoever? Has anybody ever slapped the water with anything? A pool noodle? Any, does it part for you? It doesn't part, does it? It stays right where it was. The difference is, God said, do this. And they were obedient to do it. God had his spirit, his Holy Spirit on Elijah and said, do this. And Elijah said, you got it. No questions asked. Whack. (laughs) Tell me that's not awesome. When God moves and does something incredible, something impossible in your life because you were obedient and you get to see that, that's amazing. That's called a miracle. And that's something that you need to give him glory and honor and praise him for. It is worthy of his praise. So then Elisha's watching and Elisha's asking, hey, can I have a double portion of what God gave you? Because they were told God's going to take Elijah. He's going to take him. He's gone. And Elisha keeps, keeps tracking along behind him. And he says, if you see me when God takes me, then you'll have your double portion. And he sees. He doesn't stay behind. He's even told to stay behind from humans. But he doesn't. He goes anyway because he is being driven on by the Spirit of God, knowing that God is going to use him for more greater things in his life. He knows this is, this is where I am right now, but it's not where I'm going to stay. So he follows and he sees Elijah being taken up and he sees Elijah's mantle falling to the ground and he goes and he gets it and he puts it on. And he's like, come on, God, come on, God. He's like, I put it on. I don't feel any different. What? I, I expected it to feel a little different. Um, but it really doesn't. It doesn't feel any different, but I've got it. I mean, he told me if I see it, you know, and I've got it. And then he starts going back. God said, go back. So he starts going back and guess what? He hits the same stinking river, the same place. 
I, how am I supposed to go back? And then he's like, oh, yeah. Remember that really cool thing that God did? Let's see. Takes it off and says, the God of Elijah. Basically, move through me too. Slaps the water. Has no idea if it's going to work or not. He hasn't seen anything like this work through him. He's seen other people do it. God, you do it through other people. Please, please do it through me too. Bam, hits the water. Woof. And he's like, yeah, <laughs> I got it. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. And that starts to fuel. It starts to fuel that faith that, yes, I can do what God wants me to do because he's working through me. He knew if I walked up to that thing and slapped it with my own cloak, out of my own power, it's not going to work. But now he knows. He knows because Elijah spoke into him, you will have this. And it all just started lining up for him. And then he started walking in the power and the authority of God Almighty. He was obedient and he did what he was supposed to do in order to do this. Absolutely incredible. I want to take us back to Numbers chapter 20, verses 8 through 12. This story is another awesome example of God's power. Super awesome example of God's power. God's talking to Moses here. He says, take the staff and you and your brother Aaron gather the assembly together. Speak to the rock. Speak to the rock before their eyes and it will pour out its water. What do you mean it's water? Rocks don't have water. You got to understand, the Israelites are walking through the middle of a desert. If you look where this is, where they believe that this actually happened, there's physical proof of it. If you, if you look at where that is, it's literally in the middle of a barren, dry desert. You can Google Earth it. It's pretty stinking awesome. But they're all dying. Of, they're not dying yet, but they are extremely thirsty, and they're really upset with Moses because they don't have anything to drink. They're like, you let us out here, and now we're going to die of thirst. Thank you. Appreciate it. Back in Egypt, we had water, we had plenty of food to eat and all this stuff, and they just they start grumbling. So God does the impossible. He tells them to do the impossible. He says, speak to that rock before their eyes, and it will pour out its water. You will bring you, you, the word says you will bring out of it. You will bring out of the rock for the community so they and their livestock can, can drink. There was quite likely... Over a million people and animals. That's a lot. You, I mean, you got to have a lot of water. That's a lot of water, guys. But he says, I will pour out so much so that they can all drink. So Moses took the staff from the Lord's, um, from the Lord's presence as he, just as he commanded him. He and Aaron gathered everybody together. He was sick of listening to them, running their mouths. I'm paraphrasing a little bit together in front of the rock. And Moses said to them, Listen, you rebels. He's throwing out a little name calling here. Uh, he doesn't always get it right. But he says, Listen, you rebels. Must we bring you water out of this rock? Sometimes when I read this stuff, it just blows my mind. <laughs> God had patience with him. Um, but he has patience with me too, so I, I guess it shouldn't blow my mind that much. But the way that Moses does this, says, Then Moses raised his arm and struck the rock twice with his staff. God said, Speak to it. But he struck it with a staff instead. He strikes it with the staff. Water gushed out in the community, and their livestock drank. But the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Because you did not trust in me enough to honor me as holy in the sight of the Israelites... You will not bring this community into the land I, I'm giving them. God still did what he said he was going to do, even though Moses didn't obey to the exact letter of what God told him to do. God still wanted his people to be able to drink. He still wanted to take care of his people, even though Moses didn't carry it out exactly like God told him to. God still... Do you realize that God... The Israelite community, they didn't know that God told him to speak to the rock. 
They didn't know. They just see their leader getting up, calling them names, you know, and, and acting in a specific way. But then God still answered. It's, it's mind-blowing. It's absolutely mind-blowing. I'm not saying that we should do that. I'm saying that he had to pay the consequences for not doing it the way God told him to. But God still brought forth the outcome that he wanted the Israelites to have. That brings me a whole lot of peace. Because I know that there's times where I don't do things the way God wants me to. But he says, you know what? I'm doing this so I'll get the glory, not for you to get the glory. Let's fast forward to the New Testament. After Jesus had come, Jesus lived his life. Jesus is living this life. And Jesus has been spending this time with his disciples, teaching them how to be like him. Teaching them what he wants them to be like. You know, constantly loving on them, constantly correcting them and all this stuff. And um, Jesus had just fed thousands of people with nothing. They just saw that. These disciples, they've been walking with him, talking with him. They've seen him cleanse lepers, heal, heal people, raise people from the dead even at this point. And then they're out on this boat in the middle of the night and a storm is just whipping against them. And they're working hard. Jesus told them, go to the other side. Get in the boat and go to the other side. And they're trying to do that. That's literally what they're trying to do. But it's, it's very difficult. The journey is not easy. In fact, they're, they're at a place right now where they could very likely die. The wind and the waves are extreme, and they're in a small boat. People have died on this, on this uh, lake before, probably people that they all know. So immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into this boat and go ahead to the other side. While he dismissed the crowd, after he had dismissed them, he went up on the mountainside by himself to pray. Even Jesus himself had to spend time with the Father. Not just had to, he wanted to. It was his desire because he knew that he had a purpose on his life that he had to achieve, and he couldn't achieve this purpose without the Father God's help. It wouldn't be possible. He says, I only do what I see the Father doing. I only say what I hear the Father say. So he had to spend deliberate time with him. If he did, so do we. He went up. To pray with the Father by himself. It says, Later that night he was there alone, and the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. So it was just getting slammed. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. God had parted water before and sent people through on dry ground. There's four times it was recorded that he had done that. We haven't had it recorded that anybody's walked on this water yet. Like it's been parted, but nobody's walked on it yet. So it says that he comes out to them walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and they cried out in fear. There's going to be times where we experience things in life that scare us. Honestly, there is. Even when we're in the middle of doing what God told us to do. These guys, they knew Jesus. They had spent a long time with Jesus, and they see him walking out on the water, and they're terrified. They think it's a ghost. He had just multiplied practically no food at all to feed thousands and thousands of people. They've experienced all these things. In fact, they just experienced a very powerful move of God where he used them to accomplish it. And still, right after that, something comes up. Life is difficult. They're getting challenged with things that they, they feel like God has left them. He's not here. The one that answers these prayers, he's not with us. And they see him walking on the water, and they're terrified, and they believe it's a ghost. Sometimes when God moves, we might not see it for what it is. 
Sometimes we might be confused by what He's doing even when He's coming to us to help us in our time of need. Shortly before dawn, Jesus walked out on the lake. When the disciples saw Him, they thought that it was a ghost and they cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. He didn't say, you idiots, you bunch of morons, it's me. What do you, you think it's a ghost? It's me. Come on, don't be stupid. He didn't, because he's not me. He says, take courage, it's I, it is I, it's me, guys, it's me, Jesus, don't worry, I'm here. They're worried about being taken out by the water, and Jesus is walking on the water. They're like, this is going to drown us. This is going to take our lives. And he says, take heart. I've overcome the world. I walk on the water. I walk on what you think is going to kill you. I have control over it. I have authority over it. There's nothing I don't have authority over. Not the wind. Not the waves, not this water, nothing. I have authority over all of it. Peter pipes up. Lord, if it's you. <laughs> if it's you. Tell me to come out. Tell me to come out and walk on the water. We'll see if this is really Jesus. And he says, come on. If you're man enough, do it. And by Peter's faith, he said, all right. All right, let's do this. And he literally steps out of the boat. And Peter, Peter himself, Human Peter, physical Peter, with Peter's 100% man body, gets out and by faith walks on the same thing that he was just seconds ago afraid that it was going to kill him. But by faith in Jesus, he now had authority over what he was just afraid was going to take his own life. That's all it took. That is literally all it took. He didn't have to blow up some kind of floaty shoes beforehand. He didn't have to lay out some flotation device to be able to step out on it. It was only by faith in Jesus Christ, knowing that he is who he says he is, that he will do what he says he will do. And if Jesus can do it, Peter said, then I can too, because I trust you. You told me to do it, so I'm going to do it. And he did. He literally did. That's thinking powerful. That same God is the one that just says, trust me, and I'll give you the power to do what I can do. Trust me. Put your faith, put your hope, put your trust in me, and do what I tell you to do when I tell you to do it. You know, Peter, he had to do it right then. If he would have said, I'm going to take a boat out tomorrow, and I'm going to try it then, would Peter have... Would Peter have been able to walk on the water at that point? No, because Jesus said, come. Come now. Get out now where you can see me and I can see you. When I tell you to step out, step out. And that water, you will be able to walk on. It doesn't matter if it looks impossible. <laughs> it doesn't matter. There is nothing that's impossible with God. Jesus said... It's easier for a camel to go through the little bitty eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. But, he says, with God, this is impossible. Or without God, this is impossible. But, or with man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Isn't that awesome? He said, you can't do it by yourself, but you can do it with me. And I want you to do it with me. Peter got down out of the boat. He walked on the water and came toward Jesus. Wow. 
It says, but when he saw the wind, he was afraid and began to sink and cried out, Lord, save me. Dude, you were literally walking on the water. (laughs) You realize that? You were walking on the water. But he saw his circumstances, took his eyes off Jesus, and he started to sink. It doesn't say he went, boom. He started to sink. Then he cries out again. Recognize that the first thing he said was, God, Jesus, if it's you, have me come out. And Jesus did. Like his eyes were fixed on him. Because he was trying to figure out, is this even Jesus? Is this real? And he says, come on out. And then he does. He gets out and he's doing what God's called him to do. And then he realized, man, that wind is really whipping It's really whipping. It is difficult doing what God told me to do. This isn't as easy as I expected it to be. I thought I'd step out here and the wind wouldn't bother me. It wouldn't affect me. I didn't realize I was going to be getting slapped by these waves still. What's going on? And he he starts to see the natural again. And that was more real to him than the supernatural. But the supernatural is more real than the natural. I promise you. Every day, all day. It was here before, it'll be here after. And it wasn't until he looked back at Jesus and said, Lord, help me. And Jesus didn't say, nope. You you had it going, but now you don't. Nope, you're on your own. No, (laughs) because he loved Peter and he loves you when times get tough. Guess what? He's still going to reach back out, grab you by the hand, say, look at me. Look at me. Keep your eyes fixed on me, and I'm going to get you where I want you to go. You're not going to do it on your own. Guess what? You can't leave tomorrow and just go walking out on the water all by yourself. You're going to do what I want you to do when I want you to do it. And I'm going to provide for you. I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to grab you by that hand, and we're going to walk together. Because you're not made to walk it alone. You can't do it in your own human flesh and in your own human strength. It's not possible. But with me, it is possible. A couple more things that he wanted that God made us for more to do is to cast out demons. You know, we get so so in fear of Satan's power. The fact that he has these little demons. The fact that there is a force that hates God and that hates you. And we go, oh, I don't, I don't want to be around that at all. I don't even want to think about it. I don't want to talk about it. God says, cast them out. You have the authority to cast them out. You have the authority to cast them out. Jesus sent out the disciples in groups of two. He sent out 72 of them. They returned with joy and said, Lord, Even the demons submitted to me in your name. Even the demons. There is power in the name of Jesus Christ. And if you feel something attacking you, speak his name. There's more authority and more power in that name than in all the earth. Than in every single demon and in Satan himself. It doesn't matter if you're literally facing Satan himself and every single one of his demons. There's more authority in the name of Jesus Christ than there is in all of them. The word says, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. They must submit to that authority. They absolutely must. Am I saying that it's not going to be scary? It, It may be a little scary. Sometimes it is scary whenever you're dealing with things that you're not used to dealing with. You know what? But the more you deal with them, the less that's going to be scary. The more you're going to realize the authority that God's given to you. Jesus said, it's better for you that I go so that the Holy Spirit, the helper, can come and literally live inside of you so that you can take authority over all this. It's awesome. Jesus said that he prays that we will be one with one another and with him just as he is with the Father. And he tells us time and time again, I have made your name known. Guys, that is where the authority lies. And then in healing, 
You know, we have lots of people that struggle with, with uh, physical ailments and, and uh, mental and emotional things and stuff. But God is our healer. He is the great physician. If he is, then you are. You have God living in you. Take that authority and speak it out. Lay your hands on the sick and watch them be healed. Take that authority. If Jesus can do it, you can do it because he's given you the Holy Spirit. If you don't have the Holy Spirit in you, ask the Holy Spirit to come in you. Say, I surrender myself and I want you to be in me, living in me and working through me. And he will because that's what he wants to do. Acts 3, 6 says, One day Peter and John were going up to the temple at the, ti at the time of prayer. Isn't it amazing they were still going to the temple after the Pharisees and Sadducees just brutally murdered and tortured their best friend? But they can do that because they saw him come to life again. They could forgive because John himself heard Jesus say, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. And if Jesus could forgive them, then they were supposed to as well. They were still supposed to go to the temple. It's amazing. We have people today that say, I, I don't want to go to church. I, it's easy enough to just sit at home in my PJs and watch it online. But these guys, they went even knowing that the people that were there murdered, brutally murdered their best friend. But they had the hope. And at three in the afternoon, now a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful where he was put every day to beg uh, from those going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. But Peter looks at him, same dude that walked on the water, also the same dude that denied him three times, also the same dude that Jesus forgave three times and restored three times, that said, I'm going to build my church on you. Same Peter. Peter said, look at me, look at us. And that meant that term that he used was intently. He looked at them intently and he said, look at us intent, with intent. He said, um, so the man gave them his attention. He actually did look at them, expecting to get something from them. He was expecting silver or gold. He was expecting some kind of money that everybody had given that had been going into the temple forever. The same thing that wasn't making him well. He was asking for something that he thought that he needed or wanted. He was asking for the wrong thing. Then Peter said, silver and gold I do not have. I don't have money. You might not have a lot of money when you're doing what God told you to do. He says, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. He took the authority that God had given him and the man, he took the man by the hand, and he walked. He got up and left with more than what he had asked for. Isn't that awesome? That's our God. That's our God. There's also two more things that I was, I was going to read these, but I'm not going to. Back in 2 Kings 4, 18 through 37, uh, is a time where God raised uh, a dead child back to life. And then again in Acts 20, verse 9, you guys think that I, that I preach for quite a while, and I do, but Paul was preaching for so long that somebody fell asleep and fell out of the window and died. At least you don't have that, right? Maybe some of you fall asleep, but falling from your chair probably isn't going to kill you. If you do die, you're in the good, you're in the right place though, I guess, because we're going to <laughs> We're going to stand on that authority. But he goes down, he picks him up, raises him to life. God raises him to life again. And then he goes back, keeps eating and, and preaching. He's, and he probably said, let that be a wake-up call to all the rest of you. No more falling asleep in my sermons. <laughs> but the fact is, is that God used... Those, those different times. There's multiple other times where he literally raised people from the dead. He heals sick people. He casts out demons. He parts water. He does the absolute impossible. But he did the impossible with all these people. You know what's interesting about every single one of these people? They all have recorded sin. 
they all were humans. They all had good days and bad days. They did right things and wrong things. But they all loved God. They all trusted God. That's what I want to encourage you guys with. Love the Lord your God. Trust Him enough that He's going to accomplish His task and purposes through you. Be willing to step out whenever He tells you to step out. The other day I was reading in Genesis twenty two twelve. The angel of the Lord called to him from heaven, Abraham. God gave Abraham a son and says, I'm going to make, I'm going to make you the father of many nations. And then he tells him, come take your son and crucify him. Or not crucify him, but sacrifice him to me. And everybody's like, what in the world? That is weird. That's not the God I know. God wanted to see if he would trust him with everything. It said the angel of the Lord called to him. So he, he's obedient. He takes Isaac up there. I was like, where's, where's the sacrifice? We got the wood, we got the fire, we got the altar. Like, we've come all this way. Where's the sacrifice? Where's the lamb that we're supposed to sacrifice? And Abraham says, God will provide. Don't worry, God will provide. And all the way up to the very last second, he draws out his knife. He's got Isaac down there. Isaac's probably not a little boy at this point. He's probably considerably older. Isaac wasn't saying, you lost your mind, Dad. <laughs> nope. There's a lot of things I'm going to do, but this ain't one of them. He didn't say that. He said, well, all right, I trust you. And he gets up on there, and Abraham gets ready to sacrifice his son, his only son. And the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. The same God that told him to do this, to follow all these steps, to sacrifice his son, the same one that said do this, called out to him and stopped him. And he said, now I know that you fear God. This fear, this is not a, oh my goodness, I'm scared to death of this God. This fear means a love, a reverence. In honor, you'll do anything for me. He says, now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Basically, he says, now I know that you love God. Now I know that you love me more than you even love your own son. More than anything, because what you've asked for throughout your whole life has been this son. That's what you've asked for more than anything. And now I know you love me even more than that. You know, Abraham reckoned in his heart that God gave him Isaac. He knew that even if he killed Isaac, he knew that God made him a promise that you're going to be the father of many nations because of this boy. I'm going to do it through this boy. So he thought, God, you're God. You made him in the first place. Even if I kill him and do what you told me to do, you're just going to raise him from the dead. So cool. You get the glory and the honor. And right then God says, nope. Now I know you trust me. Now I know you love me so I can move forward. God said to me whenever I was reading this, he said, spoke it as plain as day. It wasn't an audible voice, but it was, you know that you know. You know how, how you hear the voice of God. Some of us hear him differently, but it's this 100% like immediately, as soon as I read that, God said, and this is how you know that I love you, because I did not withhold mine either. I didn't keep my son back from you either. He's telling Abraham, I know you love me because you didn't even withhold your one and only son. And this is how you know I'm proving to you that I love you because I'm not going to withhold mine either. And Jesus was that absolute perfect, perfect, spotless lamb, that sacrifice 
taking all of our sins and all of our shame, and he bore that on the cross. So whenever Satan's trying to lie to us and say, you're not good enough, you're not good enough to follow God because you still have sin in your life, Jesus stands there and says, wait, I think you forgot something. I took that. I paid that price. Yes, Nathan did do that, but I paid the price for it because I love him and I want him to have this relationship with me because I love you and I want you to have this relationship with me. Now you can walk out in the authority regardless because of what he's done, not because of what you've done. I love it. It's so amazing. I'm a little bit past my time, but... Guys, I think that this is this extremely, extremely important for us to know. This is how we do the more. How we are made for more, this is how we do it. We're made for more. Start walking in it. Be who he's called you to be because he's given you the authority to do it. We'll probably kick on some worship songs and... Uh, the front will be open. Please, please hear this. There's nothing more important than you can do right now than to surrender your own will to Him. To lay yourself down, your wants, your needs, your desires, to surrender them to Him and walk in the more that He's created you for. And if there's anybody that hasn't surrendered yourself, that you aren't walking in the more that he's created you for, now's the time to spend with him, to come up here. You can use these, these altars. You can pray by yourself. We'll pray with you if you want. But don't leave the same as you came in. Don't. Don't leave the same as you came in. Allow him to do the more through you. Heavenly Father, God, I just pray that you will speak to us through your Holy Spirit. And Holy Spirit, I pray that you will reveal to us what you want us to have out of today's message, God. Take the blinders off of our eyes, Lord. Remove the restrictions off of our heart, God. I pray that you will give us the faith where we lack faith. Make us strong where we're weak, Lord. I pray that there will be less of me and more of you. God, help us to decrease so that you can increase. Increase in love, God. Increase in caring. Increase in giving. Increase in telling. Increase in showing people. Increase in being who you've created us to be. God, be the more in us and through us, God. Be the more to our areas of influence so that you will get the glory and the honor and the praise. We love you, Lord, and we dedicate our lives to you, God. We will do what you want us to do, when you want us to do it, where you want us to do it, how you want us to do it, God. We are surrendered to you, your bond servant, gladly, because you love us so much, God. Lord, we dedicate this day to you. We dedicate our lives to you. In everything we do, we pray these things in Jesus' name.